Well, good morning. I'm glad you could join me this morning. I know that this is getting kind of um, tedious for us as we continue to meet this way. Now, a couple things we got going on is that the governor uh, has basically extended us quite a bit in um, what we're doing. So we got to continue to do this. Uh, as we're going to participate and do what we should to try to make sure everybody's healthy, try to take care of everybody. We want to make sure that uh, we don't contribute to this pandemic and we don't want to see any of our people get sick. Uh, it would be horrible for it to spread through our church because we were meeting too soon. And the people that would be most vulnerable to this are the people that's going to come to the services out of faithfulness and love for God and we just don't want to endanger anybody right now. So bear with us. Let's keep it going a little longer. And we'll be back together, though. This will not be forever. And we'll be back together in our church. Some, and the church is going to be freshened up. And it's going to look good. And we'll gather together and we'll worship together. So this morning, we're going to be in Joshua. We're going to be in Joshua chapter 7. Main verse is verse 10. Father, we thank you for the people gathering together. We thank you for folks taking time to click a link. I know that it's not the same right now, but we just pray that you teach us from your word and that we can grow together. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Joshua chapter 7, you'll kind of be there for a while. Um, we'll look at a few different verses there. Rising up from defeat. That's our main thing. So in Joshua chapter 7, verse 10, verse 10, our main verse, the Lord then said to Joshua, stand up. Okay. Why are you on the ground? Now, we're going to get into why he's on the ground. But before we do, and why he needs to stand up, let me say, this is not directed at anything going on with the pandemic. I, I don't have an agenda in this. But there's some really good advice in here for our mayor, our governor, our president on what we need to do in the midst of this pandemic. But more importantly for you and me right now is that you see there's lessons for you. There's lessons for you in this that anything you're going through, any defeat you have felt, in any failing, whether it be a moral failing or some consequences of someone else's decisions or anything you're facing, there's good advice for Joshua from God himself in the text. So first of all, Joshua is called and commissioned from the Lord. The people didn't do this, God called him. So he, he's got that, he knows. And it's pretty amazing to think that he was born a slave and then he became the leader of Israel. And he's got all these people under him as he's leading them through. Moses chose him early on to be one of the guys to scout out the land. And he was one of those dudes in Numbers chapter 13 that was willing to obey God and say, yes, we can take this land because God said we can. And it's good land and we need to go in there, him and Caleb. So he's a great choice to go because he's faithful in that. He's got his famous line, you know, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So he's a wonderful leader. And you got to have a good leader to follow such a great leader like Moses anyway. So Joshua was appointed to lead Israel into Canaan. You find that in Deuteronomy chapter 31. Joshua um, commissioned by God in Joshua chapter 1. Now, we covered that in church on a Sunday night. How God told them, you know, everywhere, you, in, 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 it's in verse 3, everywhere the foot of your, the sole of your foot treads, I will give this unto you. I will give this land to you. We talked about how he would have victory and he, everywhere he had gone, as long as you're faithful, you're going to be good. So he's crossing in chapter 3. They go across the flooded Jordan. I covered that last time. And Joshua chapter 6, we went into a little more detail 
how they conquered Jericho. So ever since Joshua has come on the scene, it's just been victory after victory. They've just been doing great. And you start kind of thinking, well, yeah, we can't lose. But then chapter 7 hits, and I want to encourage you to read it. Uh, I don't have time. It'd be a whole other thing. Chapter 7 hits, and they get beat. They get beat up. They lose lives. It's not good. And Joshua has three responses in this that he's got to work through. First of all, he's got to stop questioning the character of God. That was his first response. That's never good. And I'll explain more of that. But then, Joshua, he's got to stop focusing on this defeat. We lost. Fine. We need to move on. First, why did we lose? What went wrong? Let's fix it and let's move on. But he wasn't doing that. All he could think about was the defeat because he's the leader and now he's taking it personally, you know. Then Joshua's got to stop worrying about public opinion. When you're following God and you're doing what God tells you to do, it does not matter what anybody else thinks. And I can take that to a personal level. It doesn't matter what your parents think if you're obeying God. And I'm talking about you're grown and you decide a decision for your family, what's best for your children, your wife, your husband, whatever, and you know it's from God. It doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't matter what your friends think. All that matters is you feel like you've really heard from God and God wants you to do this, so you're going to do it. That's what matters. All right. The Lord called him in verse 10 to get up. The question that came to my mind was, how? After defeat, after all this, how do I get up? Well, let's talk about that. One way to do it is, first of all, Joshua's got to stop questioning God's character. That does not mean you can't question God. It doesn't mean you can't ask why. It does not mean that you ever, you, you won't do that. That's okay. God knows. And if you honestly just want to know how, I mean, Mary, when she was told that she would bring forth the Messiah, she said, how could this be? She didn't sin against God when she did that. But when John the Baptist daddy was taught, told and he started questioning, he did it the wrong way. There's a way to question God and there's a way to not question God. Joshua did it the wrong way. Let's look at verse 7 of the same chapter. Oh, Lord God, Joshua said, why did you ever bring these people across the Jordan to hand us over to the Amorites for destruction? You're blaming God. If only we had been content to remain on the other side of the Jordan. Well, why were they not going to remain on the other side of Jordan? Because God told them not to remain on the other side of Jordan. So he said, why did you? Something goes wrong, and his first inclination is to blame God. I want us to consider the good things God's done for these people. If you go and you look through your scripture and see how God has delivered over and over and over, that art to influence how you respond to a loss, a defeat. Because you've had victory after victory. There's been some hiccups, but you've had victories. Uh, God sent Moses to bring them out of Egypt, Exodus chapter 3. Uh, God opened up the Red Sea for them, Exodus chapter 14. Victory, victory. Uh, he provided for them. How did he provide? He gave them manna when they were hungry, Exodus chapter 16. He took and gave them water out of a rock when they were thirsty, when they were complaining, Exodus chapter 17. And then even when Joshua became the leader, he led them across the flooded Jordan, did the whole Red Sea thing again at the Jordan, and they walked across. Joshua chapter 3 was that. Now in Joshua chapter 6, he gave them the power, so he's given them victory, he's given them provisions, now he's given them the power, in Joshua chapter 6, to defeat mighty Jericho. Jericho's a big deal, and they go in, 
and they wipe them out in a really weird way, but it worked because God showed them his authority and his power. I'm in control here. Now, after one defeat, Joshua says, God, somehow this is your fault. Why did you do this? My point in that is, he never stopped and said, Lord, what did we do wrong? See, often we, we don't stop and evaluate ourselves in the midst of defeat, in the midst of whatever. You fill in the blank, whatever that thing is. We need to stop and first of all and say, is this consequences of my decisions? Because that's exactly what it was. You can go back and read it. Uh, I'm trying to whet your appetite for it. I don't want to just spoon feed you. If you want to go read it, go check it out. It's really cool. This is what was going wrong. But now after one defeat, Joshua does the wrong thing. He, this is not good. He's going to blame God for it. What about you? Think about everything God has done for us. He loves us. He gave us Jesus. I mean, that's, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, he offers us salvation. Because Jesus is salvation. And by faith, you can receive him. And when you receive him, you can come unto him. You've been given the right to be called a child of God. You've been purchased by his blood, all that stuff. So God has done all kinds of things for us. So how can we, you and me, how can we question God's character when things don't go the way we think they ought to go? Somehow it's on God. There's a lot of things at play. It could be other people. And you're totally innocent in it, but their decisions have consequences for you. It could be you. It could be your fault. Or it could be that God's doing something. You can't see the end results, but God knows. And you just need to trust in God's character. My point is God is good. God's character is good. So whatever happens, there's things that happen that we don't like, we don't understand, but God's character is never in play in this. All right. So how can we blame God for our defeats? Joshua blames God. God. Joshua questions God's character. It's okay to question God, just not the character of God. So Joshua, next thing he needs to do, the guy has got to stop focusing on this one defeat. Sure, find the reason. Make the solution. But move on. You can't waller around in your defeats. You can't do it. And we are good at it. I am good at it. I can relive it. I can play it over and over in my mind as I'm laying there in the bed with my head on my pillow and I ought to be sleeping. Uh, you know, we, we all need to be doing a better job when it comes to moving on, forgetting these things. All right. Verse 8 of the chapter, chapter 7. What can I say? Lord, now that Israel has turned its back and run from its enemies. What can I say? Well, why is he saying it? Because he's the leader. He's got to say something. What can I say now that we've turned our back and ran from our enemies? Think of all the blessings that have already been given. Think of all the promises. That's a big deal. The promises of God throughout the Bible. They, Joshua needs to go back and think about Abraham. God promised Abraham the, the descendants, well, I'll just read it to you, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The Lord said to Abram, before he got the name changed, Go out of your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. So I'm not only going to bless you, you're going to be a blessing yourself. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you. That was a promise God made to Abram. Well, here we are. Joshua, you're one of those descendants. Uh, all those people you're leading are descendants. So you've got to trust in the promise of God. God took these people unto himself to be and make them his own people. He chose them. This all is the next thing you see after the Tower of Babel, where God takes people and says, all right, 
Everybody else is crazy. I'm just, this is Wayne's version. So I'm going to hand them over and I'm going to take these little group of people and I'm going to raise them up, make a great nation out of them, and I'm going to plant them over there in Canaan. That's kind of what's going on. That was a promise. So it has to happen. Promise given to Joshua is that, Joshua, I'm going to give you every place to foot your, 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 with the sole of your foot treads. I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to take you in there. So Joshua would become problem conscious instead of power conscious. Joshua was focused on the negative instead of the positive with this. One defeat, and he's down on the ground on his face, and he is tore up about it, and he questions God's character in it. Not good. So in spite of all the blessings and the promises, he's focused on defeat. That's what's going on. You can't do that. I can't do that. Now, I'm not questioning Joshua whether or not he was a good leader. Joshua was a great leader. But the great leaders have their moments. And you can be a great father in your home, but you have your moments. You can be a great pastor, but you have your moments. You can be a great mom and taking care of these babies and taking care of work and taking care of everything else that you do, carrying such a heavy load and just be the greatest mama in the world. But you're going to have your moments. We have to focus on the victories and the good things and the stuff that we've done. And he's got to forget this defeat and move on. You say, well, you know, is that even biblical? Well, yeah. In the New Testament, Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 through 14, he starts out and he says, brothers, he says, I, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind us and reaching forward to what is ahead. And I pursue my goal and my prize promised by God, the heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Paul's not focused on his past accomplishments or failures. Forget about what's behind. I, mean, I, I want to read that part to you. But one thing I do. Forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. I can't fix those things, but I can do something about today. I can do something about tomorrow. There's not a whole lot I can do about the past. You might need to go and ask for forgiveness. You might need to go and seek to reconcile. You might need to go and fix something. But ultimately, your main thing is you're going to have to press on because this is a race and you got to keep going. You stumbled, you failed, you messed up. But the race is still happening. Keep rolling. Keep going. Keep pushing. Keep doing. That's us. That's the Christian life. That's why Paul was so good at what he was doing. So Joshua's got to stop questioning the character of God. Joshua has got to stop focusing on this one defeat. Now Joshua's got to stop worrying about public opinion. Just do what God wants you to do. and Quit worrying about other people. Uh, it doesn't make you popular at Thanksgiving sometimes and Christmas. But if that's what's right and you're doing what God wants you to do, don't worry about it. Just do it. Let the chips fall where they may. You know. All right. Stop worrying about public opinion. Verse 9. Chapter 7, verse 9. When the Canaanites and all who live in the land hear about this, they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. Okay. Joshua, you forgot the promises. That can't happen. God's not going to let that happen. Then, what will you, God, what, what are you going to do, God? What are you going to do about your great name? Mm. Now, I don't want to read tone into it, but the way it reads is, you know, he, he's in a bad place. And... First of all, he's worried about something that never happened. We do that, right? Remember, we've been talking about this. We worry about things, and the studies show 80% of those things never even happen. So this is one of those things. But he's worried about, you know, we're going to get wiped off the face of the earth. No, that's not going to happen because God said, I'm going to make these people my people. So that's all that matters. For the Canaanites shall hear about it. That's what I mean about public opinion. 
who cares what the Canaanites hear? Who cares what the Canaanites think? Who cares what the world thinks? Who cares what your lost friend thinks? Who cares? Now, they need Jesus and you love them. That's fine. But you do not let their opinion sway you on doing the Christian life. If you got a relative or a family member that's uh, a friendship or something that you're close to you and they're not living it and they're not walking it and they're not teaching it and they, they're not a follower. Why in the world would you care what they think about what you're doing with your people, with your family, with your life, with your church, with your God? They can't begin to understand why you do some of the things you do. But if you know it's of God, who cares what the Canaanites think? For the Canaanites shall hear of it. So, God still got power. God still got authority. Joshua's got to get to the point where he's got to ask, what did we do wrong? And what can we do to make it right, God? God will take care of his own reputation. I don't have, now, I can hurt the cause of Christ by, I can hurt my witness, and I can make Christianity look bad and give uh, those who are looking for excuses not to believe an excuse not to believe. I can do that, but uh, honestly, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. God is going to take care of God's character. God, I mean, reputation. God doesn't need me to fix his reputation for everybody. He's God. You know, I have to be a kind of person that can def defend the gospel, uh, do the apologetics to defend the truth of who God is and everything and shut up the critic. But ultimately, in the end, God's reputation is going to be just fine because I've read the stuff in the end. When people are bowing and people are confessing and people are being judged by God and all these people, you can't judge me. Only God can judge me. And he will. And he will. That should be sobering. Who cares what the Canaanites think? God's going to take care of his own reputation. God will lift up his people when they're down. If you're down, get up. Get up. God is asking, why are you down? Am I not God? Have I not given you victories in the past? Have I not taken care of you? So God's brought victory to a lot of people's lives who were defeated. People who have lost loved ones. People, I mean, most of the hymns in the hymn book in the church were written out of loss and suffering where God brought people through. A lot of those songs, if you know the story behind them, they are beautiful songs. So what happened? Well, Joshua did rise up. When God tells you to get up, you get up. Joshua. Joshua led his people to the next victory. All right. Well, we can rise up. You know why? One of the biggest things is we have a resurrected, victorious Jesus. My Savior defeated death. My Savior laid down his life and took it up again in the resurrection. My Savior has given the victory. And therefore, whatever happens in this world, I am already an overcomer of whatever that thing is. Whether it be coronavirus, or it be a loss of a loved one, or it be whatever. Because this is not the end. This is not all there is. We've got so much more to look forward to beyond this. How do I know that? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 57 through 58. Let me read it to you. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't have Jesus, you already defeated. If you have Jesus, you already won, even though you might feel defeated about something, you already won. Verse 58. Therefore, so since you have victory through the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, my dear brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. 
So get up. Excel. Be immovable. Be steadfast. You might have been shaken. You might have been rocked for a little bit. Move on and serve God because it's not going to be in vain. You've had your moment. Do like Joshua. Get up and get going. Father, we thank you for our God who has already given us the victory through Jesus that we do not have to lay there in defeat. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.